My first thought is I'm not worthy. Uh, my second thought is I'm internally grateful and uh, I've got a whole lot of gratitude in me right now. Um, a little overwhelming, but thank you. Um, President Dugan, thank you for the kind and warm and generous uh, introduction as well. The faculty, the staff, the trustees, the distinguished guests and honorees, families, and the St. Francis College graduating class of 2011, congratulations. What a big day. What a big day. It is such an honor to be here with you today at the small college of big dreams. You make us all very proud. When I look out at you, I gotta tell you, I see myself, as a lot of us up here do. We see ourselves, it's amazing. And I see my own family as well. I know how hard you've worked, I know how much you've sacrificed, how much you've had to scratch and claw and fight to get to this point, and how very special this day is. I also know that it's tough to find work in a tough economy right now, or hold on to the job that you've got, or continue your education, you name it. I just wanna, I just wanna share with you a few brief stories and some of the lessons I've learned along with some of the mistakes I've made. Yes, there are many, but I'm just gonna give you a couple of them, and hopefully some of it might resonate with you. And one of the more moving experiences I've had recently in my career as a journalist came just a couple weeks ago when the President of the United States came to New York. He came to Lower Manhattan to lay a wreath at the World Trade Center site. I was privileged to be broadcasting live that day. I was downtown, you could feel the energy, the emotion, the momentousness of the moment. And all he did was he laid a wreath at the base of where the towers once stood. He did it in honor of the people we lost on 9-11. He said a silent prayer. He embraced several people who would come to honor their fallen loved ones, their friends and their colleagues. He didn't make a speech or a pronouncement. The pictures that day, they told a powerful story of a city and a nation finally acknowledging that finally some measure of justice had been done on our behalf. It was the high point of a week that began with the extraordinary news that finally we got bin Laden. And that's when the president said something that resonated with a lot of people, and I hope with you too as you go forward. He said in part, we are once again reminded that America can do, what America can do whatever we set our mind to. It really resonated with me. And, and every now and then I've learned because we need reminders like that because sometimes we lose our focus and our sense of purpose. In my case, I lost my sense of pur I lost my focus and my purpose one day right at the beginning of my career and almost ended it before it began. So there I am, about your age, a few months after I graduated from college, working my first job. At a, I'm at a TV station in Seattle. One of my duties is to answer the phones. I'd worked hard to get to this point. The phone rings on this particular day. I answer it, and it's a viewer. This guy's irate. He's upset. One of the hot news stories of the day was, was the firing of a guy by the name of Jimmy the Greek. He was a sports commentator on TV. He made some racist remarks on camera. There was a big uproar, and then he was finally fired. But the caller, this guy was defending him. He said, Jimmy the Greek was right. Those people are this, those people are that. And he goes on and on and on. And I'm listening to this guy. I'm listening and listening. And finally, after about a minute and a half of this, I said, well, I said the magic words to him. <laughs> words I can't really say in <laughs> polite company. I mean, they're, they're brothers and priests and nuns here and all. But you know what I'm saying. So I hung up the phone on this guy. Bam. Looking around, uh-oh. Phone rings again, he calls back, same guy. He gets my name, he threatens to have me fired. It's a tense conversation, as you can imagine. <laughs> we finally hang up. I'll never forget my boss's face when I told him what I had done. He went from a big, broad, broad grin to see me, and then he just buried his head in his face. I'd almost ended my career before it began. Just a few weeks, bad decision. So from that day forward, I learned the very basic concept of respecting the customer, the viewer in my case, no matter how off base they might be. That was seared into my brain, and I'll never forget it. Furthermore, think before you talk kind of helps me on the air every single day, kind of helps in personal relationships and business relationships as well. But I also recognize that just like each and every one of you, I got some fight in me. I'm a New Yorker after all, right? We don't take stuff from people. But I also recognize the need to scratch and claw and fight 
and go get yours, go get mine. And here's where it came from. It comes from the family. My parents, they settled on Long Island after coming here from the tiny Caribbean island of Dominica. You got any Dominicans here? Not a one? It's a small island. <laughs> Smaller than, say, Trinidad. My dad always had this burning desire to get an education, so he enlisted in the Air Force. And when he came out, he made use of the GI Bill to go after his dream, but he didn't do it the easy way. After he married my mom, after I came along, about a year later, he set out to make it happen by going to night school. And so began this punishing schedule, up at the crack of dawn every day, wolfed down some breakfast, off to work full time at Brookhaven Lab in the business office, inhale some dinner, rush off to class at night, get home late to study, fall asleep on the books, get up the next morning, and do it all over again. And like so many of you, he wasn't quite sure where all his blood, sweat, and tears was necessarily leading. He just knew he had to make a living to take care of his young family. If he was going to get in anywhere in life, he had to get out there and earn his education. Nobody was just going to hand it to him. Before long, he got his associate's degree in business, but he was just getting started. Soon our family expanded to four with the addition of my little brother, but my dad stepped it up some more. He went on to Hofstra. Once again, taking night classes after work every day, he just kept going and going like the Energizer Bunny, keeping up that grueling schedule, earning his bachelor's in business. Finally, when I was nine years old, we all piled into several cars, the extended family, aunts, uncles, cousins, everybody who went to the campus of CW Post one spring day. It was his graduation day. And what a proud day it was, as we watched my dad wearing his cap and his gown, just like you guys, marching across the stage at the age of 43, getting his master's in business administration, his MBA. Not only was it a crowning achievement, it was also a defining moment for his kids, for his family. From that day forward, we sort of got it by osmosis, whether we realized it or not. Education is not optional. It's the only way you're going to make it in this world, and no one can take it away from you. By the way, it wasn't that long before my dad was in charge of that business office where he had begun as a clerk. And so to the group of you today who are graduating with your families with, here, with you today, some of you have small children, I know just a few of you, but I salute you because I know what that's about. I know how intense and how powerful this moment is for you. Your family is taking a giant step forward with you today, and they will never look back. You are heroes in the truest sense of the word. I also think of some of the struggles that I faced in my career, far smaller, far less significant than anything my dad faced. Like the first time I did a live news report, very easy story. They sent the kid out, I was 23, to go cover the 4th of July fireworks out west, out in Seattle. I'll never forget it. The cameraman was set up, he had his lights, he's squinting at me. The, Crowds are gathering, and I've got this little story in my head I'm going to tell. I'm going to talk about this, I'm going to talk about that, point to the fireworks, roll the tape, wrap it up, send it back to you. Well, it was just coming up on 11 o'clock, the news time, and the fireworks had not yet begun. And I'm all nervous, my mouth is dry, my heart is pounding, I'm sweating, and I don't know what to do. And, and the anchor man, he, he sets it up and he says, Maurice Dubois, the bombs are bursting in air. It's 4th of July, happy Independence Day. What's the story? And I stood out there just freaking out and I just stood there like this. <laughs> Couldn't talk. Producers yelling in my ear, talk, say something. I'm just, uh, uh, uh. Couldn't come up with anything. They roll the tape, a couple of sound bites rolled. I, I don't know what I said and I just ultimately mumbled back to you. Have you ever seen anything like that on the air? Thank goodness, because uh, that would have ended the career again before it even started. But again, a lesson, right? I learned the importance of preparation, of having a plan B, of calming down, for crying out loud. But that applies to everything, from my daily work to even planning out free time, because you never know, the fireworks might not start on time. People always ask me what's been my favorite news story to cover, most impressive person to meet. And in a time when we're all struggling to stay afloat in this economy, we're at war on two fronts. The Middle East is unstable. When the head of the IMF got himself into, into trouble for what an apparently heinous crime, he's accused of it. When a certain former governor of a state out west has, been, has revealed to us he's been living a double life, right? 
I have a pretty quick answer for you when it comes to my favorite story to cover. It's without a doubt an everyday guy from this here city, a construction worker, a guy by the name of Wesley Autry. You might know him better as the subway hero. Remember this guy? He was waiting for the train one day uptown. A few short years ago, he saw another man fall onto the tracks, convulsing in a seizure. This is a guy who, without concern for his own safety, as an oncoming train was speeding into the station, jumped onto the tracks in front of horrified onlookers, protected the man in the space between the tracks, and as the train sped over them, with barely an inch between his back and the bottom of the train, he saved the man's life. There was a spontaneous celebration from City Hall to the White House, around the world. Newscasts, talk shows, we couldn't get enough of this guy. He became an international sensation. Yet, when I met him in his modest apartment, he was unfailingly polite, he was warm, he was humble, he was modest, he was amazed, really, by all the attention. And to this day, he remains true to himself. He's not seeking reality TV fame. He's not dancing with the stars, right? He's not an American Idol. He's not seeking personal aggrandizement. This is a guy just raising his little girls, working hard every day, doing his best, like each and every one of you. Now, we all can't be subway heroes. Matter of fact, jumping on the tracks might be hazardous to your health. But as Mr. Archery explained, all he did was help a person in need, and we can all do that. We can do well by doing good. And that's part of what St. Francis is all about. We can volunteer at schools, houses of worship, at senior centers. We can serve our communities through the countless charitable organizations doing great work in our city every single day. We can make a difference, like Mr. Archery, and find it surprisingly rewarding just by doing the right thing. And we can set an example by our actions. And my dad did that, and so many of you are doing that today. You are joining a long and impressive list and a roster of St. Francis graduates who have gone on to become leaders in their fields. You name it, business, medicine, politics, academia, finance, it goes on and on. And only you know, only you will show us who will emerge to be, let's say, our next internet guru, our law, next lawyer, our nurse, police officer, journalist, teacher, soldier, or just an everyday hero. Won't be easy, nothing worthwhile is easy, especially in these economic times, but my hope for you is when you come back, you come back to campus someday and you share your stories with the students about what you've learned out there in the real world, as they call it, you include some of these thoughts. Thinking before you talk, it helps. Setting example for your family, always having a plan B, and serving your community. I'm here to tell you it all works, especially if you set your mind to it. Class of 2011, congratulations. Thank you, and good luck.